Hi, hello again. Um, this will be blissfully short. I'm further and further away from my laboratory, and I'm used to, you, whenever you go to a March meeting, you hear the students always say, uh, the March meeting came a little early this year. Well, every talk I'm doing on technical stuff is coming a little early. But this is um, a collaboration with my longtime partner in this work, uh, Juan Q. Park, and, uh, and Arajit Gupta, graduate student. And we do this at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory in Florida State University. <laughs> I always do that. It's, it's upside down. OK. So I'll do an outline, a little bit of explaining. I don't have any fantastic conclusions. Um, this is a, I've done a lot of work in thin film growth and proximity effects since the 80s. And it's just hard stuff, and it takes a long time. So I'll start out by telling you a little bit about Andrea reflection, if you don't know about it, and the superconducting proximity effect, what planar tunneling is. A very, very, very short introduction, because most of you know what's uh, Samarium. Most of you know more about Samarium hexaboride than planar tunneling, probably. Um, I'll show some of our tunneling results that, that, so you can see what the density of states of Samarium hexaboride is in a planar tunneling junction. Um, we grow YB6 and SMB6 thin films by layers, and we make tunnel junctions on them. So that was what, what R.G. Uh, Gupta accomplished, and, and these are really hero experiments. Um, well, I'll show you tunneling conductance of YB6, Samarium hexaboride tunnel junctions, and in looking for the proximity effect, I'll repeat this in a few more slides, you can keep the normal metal, I mean, yeah, would, in this case, it's like a Samarium hexaboride, it's a normal metal, even though it's a topological insulator, and you can change the thickness I'm sorry, I have that backwards. You can keep the superconductor the same thickness and change the thickness of the normal metal or a topological insulator. And if you see consistent effects of as you increase the, uh, if you increase the normal metal thickness, TC should go down. We see intriguing evidence, but it's really not enough to write home to mom about. So our conclusions are good films, good bilayers, good tunnel junctions, no, no uh, no, uh, no conclusive results on the superconducting proximity effect. So these couple slides are a background. So Andrea reflection, we didn't, when I first started looking at proximity effects like a hundred of years ago, um, we didn't realize that Andrea reflection is the microscopic explanation for the superconducting proximity effect. So what you have is you have, in this case, this is not a topological insulator. All we have is something like niobium copper. We have a normal metal and a superconductor and their interface, a clean interface we're assuming here. So Andrea reflection is basically if you have, um, if you inject an electron into the superconductor, it retro reflects in the same angle as a hole. And you get, and it's all taken up by Cooper pair going into the superconductor. I'm going to show, if that sounds, fantastic to you, what I'll do is I'll show you this next slide here, which basically says that when you think of Andrea reflection, you have an electron coming in at the Fermi energy. So here, if you look at this picture here, there's a Fermi energy up here, and here's nominally a you know, dispersion of a free electron or in a Fermi liquid or whatever. And remember, the Fermi energy in simple metals is like volts, okay? Uh, you know, two volts, five volts, depending on the metal. If you're looking at a, a superconducting gap, that's on the order of a few millivolts. Okay. So what we're saying here, if we go, this is this is my explanation thing. What what we what we're saying here is that why would you have an electron that can't enter into a superconductor, right? You have something like a. Um, I'm going to keep doing this every time I use these things. So you have this very, very high energy electron, then it can't go into the superconductor, and the superconductor says, no, 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 you're going to retroreflect as a whole. Why does it do that? Because it's quantum mechanics, right? This is like a freight train seeing a cardboard box and still, and it's, and it's being reflected by the cardboard box, okay? It's like, um, so the reason for that is that if you try to inject it, this is the only, if you go look at the original paper by Andreev, which wasn't for transport, it was for uh, heat exchange, but the original paper is simply a boundary value problem. How do you, how do you have this electron uh, um, 
Cooper pair interface and you want to inject an electron, the boundary value question says in order to conserve charge, energy, and momentum, this is the only process. And I'm always saying when I introduce students to this, if uh, beta decay doesn't bother you, this shouldn't. It's a simple particle conversion process. In any case, going back to here, um, so this graph at the bottom here is, is very interesting. So what happens when you have this Andrea reflection is that this, this electron gets injected into here, and before it grabs another electron to make a Cooper pair, which you have to have in the superconductor, right, in the superconductor gap, you know, there, you know, there's no quasi-particles there if you have a good gap. So what happens is that this interface here, at a certain coherence length of this normal metal, and that does exist, we can talk about that another time, you actually end up breaking some pairs, so you have a decrease in the number of Cooper pairs that you find on the normal metal side. So this is simply a plot of psi, squares, psi star psi, which, is, which was uh, Landau showed us was the probability of finding Cooper pairs. I mean, Gorkup it was one that proved that. And then on the normal metal side, when the electron goes in and bounces off and a hole gets, gets sent out, what happens, it picks up the coherence, that it goes into the superconductor, picks up the coherence, so for a small distance inside the superconductor, inside the normal metal, you have picked up some of the coherence, and so you have a little bit of superconductivity. So the idea of a, of a Cooper pair linking from a superconductor to a normal metal isn't really the case. It's really a clean and dry reflection. You can calculate all this stuff. It's actually pretty cool. So, um, so uh, going right along here and um, moving along. So, how can you measure the superconducting proximity effect? So I've been doing this for a few years, and it's hard stuff, but what you can do is if you have, looking at this picture at the bottom, if you have a thin film superconductor that's about the thickness of the coherence length. So I'm just gonna walk up to here because this isn't. So you make this thin film superconductor that's only this thick, okay? And then if you make the normal metal thicker and thicker and thicker, you will have, you will, the equations show you that you will have more and more Andrea reflection that will break more and more pairs in the superconductor. So you will reduce the TC of the superconductor. That's a very hard measurement. That's a really hard measurement. I've tried that for many years in many different kinds of materials and I gave up because the numbers are very small. The better way to do it, the easier way to do it, and this has been done by a lot of people in different ways, is that you grow a normal metal, you, know, you, you draw the normal metal and the superconductor, and on top of the normal metal you grow a tunnel junction. And you see that as the normal metal gets thicker and thicker, there will be a uh, density of states induced in the superconductor, I mean a density of states from the superconductor induced into the normal metal, and that should decrease as the normal metal gets thicker and thicker. Because the, um, I'm, I wish I had more pictures here, but I was doing this too quickly. Because if, if you can imagine if you have, if you're measuring the gap in this material and the normal metal gets thicker and thicker and thicker, then the gap will be more and more decreased because there's less of penetration of the Cooper pairs or the coherence in the normal metal. So that's what we're attempting to do. Um, so I guess, I guess I did do this years and years ago. I just wanted to point this out. I said they're tough experiments. In the 1980s, I grew cerium copper-6 heavy ferromans on top of niobium and showed an interesting result about proximity effects. But we'll go on now. We'll, we're not going to talk about that here. So moving right along, and I'm going the wrong way again. I'll keep doing that. OK, so, so this is the kind of thing that the student puts in here, which is this is the nominal motivation of this experiment. I'm not sure this is the motivation of this experiment because I'm not sure about Mariana Fermions, but that's my own prejudice. But the whole idea was uh, Liang Fu and Charlie Kane came out with this really beautiful theory a bunch of years ago. And they thought that you could create a topological superconductor by putting a topological insulator on top of a, on, on top of a trivial superconductor. And so that's what we're trying to do and see what we get there. So, um, oh my gosh, what happened there? So that's the problem of going from a uh, <laughs> going from a Mac to a PC. Okay. So what we have here is a, a very very short introduction to planar tunneling. Um, so uh, 
and I, I was going to say, I, maybe I won't go into all this, but I, I will ju I'll just use the words, you can't read this, okay? You've probably all seen this before. If you have a planar tunnel junction, you have, it's flat, and you have, you have a, like a superconductor, insulator, and normal metal. And the normal metal density of states looks like the Fermi liquid up there, the superconducting, we've seen that many, many times. One thing that's very, and th this is a take home point that I'd, I'd like you to have here, is that there's something that was written in the, maybe the, I forget now, Harrison's theorem. It could have, was it the 70s? I don't remember. But people were wondering why you see a superconducting gap like that when you're tunneling. If you think about it, if you write down the tunneling equations, which are simply the Fermi Golden Rule, the most beautiful equation on, that's ever existed, what you have is in that tunnel equation, you have the Fermi velocity times the density of states. You have dE by dK multiplied by dK by dE. You should completely divide out the density of states. I'm going to say that again. When you write down the standard one-dimensional Fermi liquid tunneling equations, you should always get Ohm's law. Why? Because you, I'm going to repeat it, you multiply the Fermi velocity times the density of states and they divide out. And then people were wondering, why do you see a superconducting gap? Very simple. A superconductor is not a Fermi insulator. So just like I said in my talk yesterday afternoon, right, that in a simple Fermi liquid, the Fermi velocity, the density of states, all these properties are determined by the lattice and what's in it. When you have electron electron correlations, like in a simple superconductor, that doesn't work anymore. So what a tunnel junction measures, what a planar tunnel junction measures, is non-Fermi density of states, okay? So if you want to take that home, I wish I had time to write all this up. So will this work here? Okay, so let's, let's look and see. This is some old work that we did a while ago, which was tunneling into samarium hexaboride and it, it was, and we got the, we got the crystals uh, outside, and uh, I don't have the names in front of me right now because it was in 2016, which was, I think it was before the pandemic, so it was 600 years ago or something. So anyhow, we polished the samarium hexaboride, learned how to make good tunnel junctions, and put lead on the top. What you do is you tunnel into that, and you look at, and this is the thing that I've been doing for 100 years also, is that you look at the quality of the lead tunneling, okay? So if we look at this here in the center picture, what we see in red is the lead superconducting samarium hexaboride tunnel junction. And you can see that you see something like, that looks like a lead gap in the center, <clears throat> and you study that, and you work on these until the quality of that lead gap looks really good, because we know what a good lead density of states looks like and then you drive the lead normal, and that gives you confidence that your tunnel junction is good. So this is you know, standard if you want to look at a non-Fermi liquid material, you don't know wh whether you have a good tunnel junction or not, and the measure is to put a known superconductor as a counter electrode, drive it normal, okay? In the early days with high TC, we drove it normal with temperature. In this case, it's very easy. You can drive it normal with a kilogauss, right? That, that drives the lead normal. So in the blue curves there, again, this is old work, in the blue curves there, that's when we put on about a kilogauss of field, 0.1 Tesla, drove the lead normal. So what we have there is the density of states of the samarium hexaboride. This is not flat, okay? There's no superconductivity there, but it's not a Fermi liquid because planar tunneling measures non-Fermi liquid behavior because, because of what I just explained before. So what we did is study this in a lot of detail, <clears throat> and I'm not going to go into all this, but you can fit this just as you would expect to two Dirac cones. That was predicted what it should look like. And then these other bumps are having to do with the topological surface states interacting with the spin uh, exciton, but I, I really don't want to go into that now, so let's just move on to our thin films and proximity effects. So, so what we do in these materials, oops, backwards again, is uh, we grow the thin film growth and, and transport measurements. These are just for quality. So everything is sputtered. The samarium hexaboride and the yttrium hexaboride are both studied, uh, are both sputtered, magnetron sputtering. And what we do, since the boron tends to not, tends to, um, it gets un undercompensated, you have to add boron. 
that's something that we learned a long time ago, is that there's certain rules about sputtering, and, and alloys are very different than compounds, so you can't, you don't, what, whatever your target is, is not necessarily what you get on your substrate. If it, it is, it's an alloy, but that's not true if it's a compound. So a bunch of playing around, these are the parameters. We co-sputter samarium hexaboride and boron. We co-sputter boron, uh, yttrium hexaboride and yttrium, and we get very good films. And in all of what we're doing, the data I'm going to show you, and it won't take very long, the YB6 thicknesses is 1,000 angstroms, and we change the samarium hexaboride thickness, goes to 25, 35, 75, 100 angstroms. And we'll just show you some nice data now. So what we have here is the quality of the YB6 thin films, uh, and we see that the TC is 5.71. The literature quotes about that. It actually quotes a little bit longer. But there's a paper that says, when I've done this before in niobium, you can put a certain strain on certain kinds of superconductors and increase TC a little bit. But it looks pretty good. And the other thing is that it, it's strongly coupled. If we do the uh, HC2 experiments, we get that um, HC2 is, um, is, uh, is, is strong coupling. So we get HC2 about 1.43 Tesla. OK, so they're good films. Now this is the tunnel junk. This is the bilayer and tunnel junction. So on a magnesium oxide substrate, you go thin film, in this case, and all the ones I'm going to report you, they're, you know, RG probably grew 500 films now, but uh, I'm just going to show you four sets of bilayers. Um, YB6, and on top of that, you go the samarium hexaboride, and on top of that, to make the tunnel junction, you c there's two ways to do it. They're both comparable. One way is to in situ um, plasma oxidize the surface, and the other one is to add just a little bit of, this works a little bit better, you sputter down just a little bit of boron, so you get a boron oxide, you know, BOX, we don't know what the oxide is, the interface. And then we can get pretty reproducible tunnel junctions. So what we have here is y, YB6 silver tunnel junctions. So this is showing the superconducting density of states for YB6. Okay, so we've got the superconductor both in, We've measured several ways, and this is the density of states. Now, we fit all of these things to two models. The first one we fit that we, you know, it's like the, the industry standard is the BTK, blonder tinkum clapbook model. And that tells you what the tunnel junction is. It tells you how strong the barrier is. It tells you, you know, the gap and, and things like that, how much scattering there is in the junction. And we get pretty reasonable results, and the gap is about 4 milli-electron volts. And then I'll just keep doing that. Now here's an example of, I'm not showing you all the data on this junction, I just want to show and get this over with. But here's some temperature dependence. It looks good, okay? It looks like you'd expect for a superconducting density state to the YB6. It's got a small but finite barrier. And it's an agreement using the BDR. And what the BDR is, the Brinkman, Dines, and Rao. This is another industry standard that if you want to figure out what your tunnel barrier looks like, you fit it to a parabolic background. If you, you know, all your, all your information is down in the millivolt if you want to find the density of states. But when you get out to the high energies, you better see a parabolic background. Okay, until you get to very high energies, then it goes exponential, but that's another story. So the fact that we get this beautiful parabolic background, that red line in the middle is the fit, means these are pretty darn good tunnel junctions. And in each of those, you can see the thickness is like about 20 angstroms in all of them, and the height is like 1 to 3 EV, 1 to 4 EV. So, you know, that's pretty reproducible when it comes to planar tunnel junctions. You know, the exact value isn't so important, but if it went from 1 to 600 EV, that would be a problem. So, so this is pretty reproducible for fabricated tunnel junctions. Um, so here's one. That was 25 angstroms. So the, the data that I showed you here and on the previous slide was 1,000 angstroms of YB6, 20, 25 angstroms of, um, of, uh, of samarium hexaboride. And we see that there is, we can, we can see tunneling, the temperature dependence of the tunneling, and a nice background that is a good tunnel junction. When we go to 35 angstroms, um, I'm doing this again. When we go to 35 angstroms, it's a messier tunnel junction. RG measured these many, many times. These are some of the best junctions, of course. That's what you show when you're at a conference or in a paper. But it's pretty reproducible that at 35 angstroms, the superconductivity looks a little weaker. The gap is smaller, and, and you, you know, 
and then going on, and then we can see it still looks like a good tunnel junction over up to, you know, a couple hundred millivolts, you still have a parabolic tunneling conductance. So it's a good, strong tunnel junction. Uh, moving right along, we go to 75 angstroms. By 75, so this is, I should have more pictures here, I apologize. You have the superconductor, you know, YB6, you samarium hexaboride that's now grown from 25, 35, now it's 75 angstroms. You're tunneling into there and you don't see the superconductivity of the YB6 under the SMB6. I hope I'm not 10 more minutes, I hope I'm four more minutes. But, um, so, so this, if you can remember in your head, what the tunneling into the samarium hexaboride single crystals were that I showed you earlier on. It had these two Dirac cone shapes. This is what it looks like. It's a little blurred, but you know, it's a thin film. But it still looks like it's samarium hexaboride. Now we're going to go to the, uh, to the, um, I went the wrong, do you think I went the wrong way again? I wonder if I'll ever stop doing that. So even in this case, where we don't see any superconductivity, Oh, let me go back and make another statement. Remember I told you that if you wanted the quality, this is something I figured out by using lead tunneling into, into YBCO in the 80s, okay? Um, was that uh, if you do enough of these, right, you, you do the lead tunneling and you drive the lead normal and you measure all the, all the density of states of the new material, in this case, samarium hexaboride, you do this enough times, the quality of the density of state of the samarium hexaboride is no weaker a tunnel junction diagnostic anymore. We know what this looks like. So this looks like all the tunneling is samarium hexaboride. So even though, you know, we don't see lead, we still know that that is what the samarium hexaboride density of states in that energy range is supposed to look like. And so moving right along, then the 75 angstroms, now we go to 100 angstroms. So this is the tunneling 100 angstroms. Again, the other one was not as clear. This, is, this looks almost like the bulk samarium hexaboride tunneling, okay? So, <clears throat> so where are we now? And that, again, again with this, um, we have a parabolic tunnel junction up to more than a couple hundred uh, milli-electron, millivolts. So, um, you know, these are good tunnel junctions. We're not done. So this is our summary. This is my last slide. I have another slide, but I'm gonna let, it, let the slide slide. So we have great, high-quality planar tunnel junctions, okay? Good, great films, great bilayers, great tunnel junctions. We have data on 25 and 35, and when, it's, when, when there's a thinner film of, uh, so, so we tunnel into the, into the superconductor, YB6, and we see the tunneling density states. We put a little thin film of 25 angstrom of the samarium hexaboride on the top, and we still see the, t the, the superconducting density states of the YB6. You make it a little thicker, now 35 angstroms, it's a little weaker. You jump to 75 angstroms and 100 angstroms of the thickness of the topological insulator, and we don't see the tunneling density of states of the YB6 anymore. So this is sort of what you would expect if there was a proximity effect uh, for, you know, niobium copper or something like that. But all we can say is that we're gonna keep working on this and see what we can find. Do I ever think I'm gonna see a Myron a Fermion? I don't, I, again, I would love to challenge anybody, but I don't see what the difference is between a Myron a Fermion and an Andrea bound state, but that, that's my thought. So these are my non-conclusions, and I'm happy to answer any questions if I'm able to. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll sit up here at the next, and we'll, we'll make up, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a beautiful day to set. Um, so, uh, well, I have a question about the samarium hexavariety thin films. I mean, you guys have done like a wonderful growth like a, from 2.5 nanometer to all the way to 100 nanometer, right? So my question is that were you able to characterize the quality of thin film? Like for instance, 2.5 nanometer compared with 100 nanometer thin film. Like uh, is uh, the quality the different? Of the samarium hexaboride? Yeah, yeah, samarium hexaboride. And they said, yeah. And they said like single crystalline quality thin film or polycrystalline yeah, thin um, film? Yeah, they're, they're uh, polycrystalline. 
they're oriented. I don't remember all the data because I haven't turned a knob in my laboratory in years, and you'll have to ask Arajit. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, sh I was so when I was throwing this talk together, I was looking for the data. But there are data that exists, and as it gets a little thicker, the samarium hexabore gets better. But it also getting good X-ray diffraction on a 25 angstrom film, we just don't have it. So we've done some EDAX on them, and we get the ratios is about right. But as far as the crystallinity, we haven't really looked at that. Mm -hmm. We just don't have, you know, we, we, it would be nice to. We can, maybe you can help us. <laughs> Thank you. But that, that's a perfect question. Thank you. May you say something about the interdiffusion at the interface because you sputter at a high yeah. temperature? So maybe this uh, influence also this, uh, the proximity, right? Absolutely, and we can't rule that out yet. You know, I would like to rule that out. Um, I think it would be difficult. I'm not quite sure how to rule that out. I don't always like to worry about that with, but uh, you know, doing something like, you know, grazing angle, uh, what do you, not, uh, x-ray diffraction is one. But, you know, I've, that's really hard. And the other one that I would love to do is, uh, what's that, um, Rutherford backscattering, right? And you can compare, but, you know, comparing Samarian, they're close in Z, but if you go, if you do Rutherford backscattering at a sharp angle, you might be able to separate those. And the other thing to do would be OJ, right, to, yeah. to dig through the OJ. But we, we don't know that yet. That's okay. definitely an open question. So you don't know any direct proof about the interface, right? Of the, between no. in your bilayer, okay. No, we don't. Okay, yeah. We don't. Okay. But we have good films and good junctions, and we don't. And like I said, I can't tell you if there's a superconducting proximity effect because there could be diffusion. Absolutely. Any other questions? And actually, I expect diffusion from my other work in growing rare earths. So, Thanks. to be honest. Yeah, that this is a follow-up. Basically, I was going to ask you the same, but um, what we do with some of these very thin layers when we modify them is to make a fib um, cut so that we can look at the interface. Oh, yeah. Essentially, and then you have not... Uh, no, we, we just started doing it. We, I don't have the person power in my laboratory. I mean, you know, so when I was doing this, when I was in the lab, I never slept. I was working, you know, and I found ways to do this, you know, with my films and my teeth running into other laboratories. I don't do that anymore. So if it's just going to be slower, I don't have the funding I used to have. So I have one student, and you know, Dr. Park is working with him, and it's just, it's a small operation. So I'm happy that we can grow nice films. You know, life's good. Arajit even won an award at a local mm -hmm. conference. So Maybe we can talk about it. <laughs> OK. Yeah, sure. I mean, any progress. There's a whole mosaic of physics. So, so if you can fill out something, you're good. So I understand very much how difficult to sterilize this film, film, so I really understand the joy when uh, somebody... So, but uh, no, I have a question about the, the... So, supposedly one can realize perfect junctions, right? And the theory in, in this superconductor topological insulator uh, speaks about these Majorana fermions, right? So, so even in the... So there is something that the theory doesn't take in account. So in some sense that even if you create a perfect material, Right, you don't see what the theory predicts. So at the end, uh, is the theory not considering something? So who, so basically, what is your opinion about this? So in some sense, so um, the theory cannot, um, so even if the experimentalist realize the best possible <laughs> structures, right? Okay. And, and we make uh, not complex ar superconducting architectures or so just basically a tunnel junction, right? and we cannot still prove or disprove the theory. So, so or we are not good as experimentalists, you know, because this is a field that is going on from, let's say, at already quite some time. And, uh, or the theory has some flow. So, uh, so what did the two? I mean, uh, we should be able to give an answer to this at some point. So what is your opinion? So give an answer to what? To whether there's a proximity effect or to so whether well, there's my if, if the, if, if the, the mm, we have not yet realized a perfect junction to prove the theory, or because it's an experimental problem, yeah. or, or the theory doesn't take into consideration something. And well, you know, isn't that the fun? Uh, okay, so, so when I was trying to learn how to tunnel into high TC junctions, right, 
I was reminded by a colleague of mine that it took people almost 30 years to make reliable tunnel junctions into niobium, right? This is hard stuff. And just like we have all these different questions in non-Fermi liquids, you know, we're going to work it out. And, uh, but, but I have to tell you, with, with um, you know, I, I do, if I start seeing zero bias modes in these things, zero energy modes, I know what to do with them. You know, I've, I've discovered many zero bias anomalies, and I've studied them my whole life. And, uh, and so when I get there, I will be able to do the analysis to see if the theory, theory is right or wrong. So, also but also I can't yet. We don't because know. because zero bias anomalies appears also in the junction of the cuprates, uh, uh, for example, if you put that's, the C. Yeah, well, that's me, right? I mean, people see zero bias anomalies, but it took a few years of work to determine how they would do to Andrea bound states and when they showed up and when they didn't show up, okay? And, you know, it was a lot of work, a lot of reproducibility, when they showed up and when they didn't show up. Seeing a zero bias anomaly in a nominally 110-oriented YBCO film, okay, isn't, doesn't prove it's an entry of bound state. It's the field dependence, it's the angle of the field dependence, it's a huge amount of things like that. And so that, that, those are the kind of things that if we get this thing reproducible, we know our interfaces, we'll nail it. I, maybe I should take a sabbatical and go into the lab. So th that's a really great question. And I, I have to say, it kind of gets on my nerves when someone shows this. And I get in trouble because I, I start picking apart the data and saying, you see a zero bias anomaly and, you know, that's great, but what have you proved? So all I can do is, that is a great statement. And, uh, and as long as you don't overclaim, okay? If you're going to make, if you're going to say that you saw a Myron of fermion, if you're going to say you saw a room temperature superconductor, those are extraordinary claims. And if they're right, they will have extraordinary proof. And, and that, that's the goal. And so I just completely agree with all the questions here. They're great. So, uh-oh. Can I disagree with yours already? No. Uh, Laura, making these thin films is certainly a challenge, and I appreciate that. Um, but I have a question with respect to your thinnest film from a completely different perspective. Um, if I recall correctly, uh, from a parallel resistor model, the uh, surface, the layer, or the thickness of the layer of the surface states was estimated to about six nanometers or so. You, you mean of the conducting surface stage of the SMB6? Yeah. Okay. So your, your thinnest films are thinner than that. Yeah. So your SMP6 is no longer an insulator. And if you go to the thicker films, then you, you basically develop, you have in between the insulating bark. You sh don't you see that transition somewhere or somehow? N not I mean, yet, not yet. You know, we don't have the analysis to say that, we, you know, the fact that we, you know, if we get, you know, so, so you know, we've thought about that but I'm really scared to make a claim. So when you're down to 25 angstrom thick, is there any insulator left in the center? Is that why we see, you know, okay? And, and I will just, and, and that has to be worked out, okay? But that also tells you that if you see the YB6 underneath, that's pretty cool, okay? You're at least seeing some gap that's going through. Is, and then as you get thicker, you have to look at that transition. And what's the big problem here? We have 25, 35, 75. Where's our 30, 45, 50, 55? That all has to be done. So I have to pay Arajit more. So, um, so th those, are, those are really, really good questions. Let me ask you the last question. No. What would be the experimental evidence for marijuana fermions in this kind of systems? Well, it would be a zero bias mode, right? But um, that's normally what it would be. But, so that, but that will appear as a peak, right? In the yeah. Of, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much okay. for a very interesting talk. And I must not forget to present you with oh, this wonderful I get another certificate picture. Oh. of your talk. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. I got another one. Oh.